Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, I am at the studios of WAKY, Wacky Radio, just outside of Louisville, Kentucky, on a, on a road trip here. I'm talking today to Marcus O'Rourke. We've talked to Marcus before. Now he's working at Link Up Communications, and he's going to give us an inside look at the Network Operations Center of a satellite distribution company and explain some of the things that I've always wondered about that's coming up next on Twerked. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio. Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiencies, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support. Online at Nautel.com. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything uh, from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, so glad to be here. Uh, I'm not in the usual Telos Alliance studio, but I, I am in a Telos studio. As you can see behind me, there is a beautiful Axia Radius console at uh, a station that actually is now under LMA. So it's not actually being programmed from here. But if they need to go on the air from here, it's it's ready to go. It's, it's absolutely ready. So uh, I am in, in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, at the uh, headquarters for uh, some very famous call letters that have been here for, I don't know, a dozen years or more. Uh, the call letters here where I am is actually W-A-K-Y, Wacky. And if you were anywhere around the Kentuckiana area uh, during, I guess, the 60s, the 70s, maybe even in the 80s, you were familiar with W-A-K-Y, Wacky Radio. And uh, 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 it's, it was great call letters. It was a fabulous top 40 station in Louisville, an AM station. And I had the distinct pleasure for a few years of working f under the tutelage of working for a general manager in, um, uh, in in Danville, Kentucky, a guy named Johnny Randolph. And Johnny Randolph uh, worked actually worked at WKLO. I don't know if he had a stint at Wacky or not, but that, I think they were competitors in Louisville. And uh, I got to work for for Johnny. Sadly, Johnny has passed on. Uh, but uh, uh, his legacy lives. He lived. Uh, he worked here at WAKY in uh, in Etown, Kentucky. Now it still hits Louisville. That's kind of the, the whole idea. It's a strong rim shot into Louisville, and they've got some translators in Louisville, and they have an AM station too up in uh, Jefferson Town, Indiana. So yeah, call letters live, and it's a very popular station. They get great ratings. So I'm delighted that they uh, let me come into the studio and do this week in radio tech from this studio. I'm on my way traveling to Louisville to uh, see my mom. And uh, it was just convenient to stop by here and do the show. So that's that's why we're here. I'm not in the usual Telos Alliance studio, but I feel <laughs> right at home with plenty of live wire around. Me. So enough about me. Uh, welcome into the show. We are going to have a great conversation today with somebody you've probably met before, who's been on before, but this is a new topic for us here. And uh, our, our guest is Marcos O'Rourke. Marcus, welcome in. It's good to see you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Good to have you on the show. You, uh, a lot of people knew you as like the, the SoCal broadcast engineer. You had a YouTube channel uh, that related to SoCal, but you've moved to uh, Colorado. You've lived there, what, a couple of years now or more, and, uh, and yeah. you still do YouTube videos, yeah? Yeah, I do, yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, no longer SoCal broadcast engineer. <laughs> what, what do you call your channel now on, on YouTube? You know, I went through so many different thoughts and iterations in my mind, and I'm like, the it's kind of what I landed on it seems a little pretentious, but whatever. What's that? The broadcast engineer, the broadcast engineer. Well, they, they, you, you know, you can't, Hey, at least you didn't pay a marketing firm a lot of money to come up with that. You came up with it yourself. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so what, <laughs> what, uh, what you've been on the show before, but on your YouTube channel, uh, you talk about broadcast engineering, but a lot of times you're talking, to lay people, you explain to non-engineers what uh, th what sites do, what what so what you know, what a tower site is, what things are there. Sometimes you're technical, sometimes you're less technical. What's what's kind of your focus? What what's your goal about this YouTube channel? Yeah, the, the goal is kind of to reach out to the newbies, to people who are kind of 
interested. Um, I originally started it off because I had a bunch of uh, managers and, and on-air people just kind of wondering what it was that I did. And like, <laughs> why are you going up to the mountain all the time? And it's like, well, I can't bring you along with me. But uh, so then I just started recording it and that's kind of where it became. Uh, and then, you know, being able to do some facility tours and, uh, you know, like KNX was a really fun one or KPCC mm. again in Southern California. Um, but yeah, it's it's been... Um, a lot of between facility tours, explaining, and kind of just showing what we're doing, what a broadcast engineer does, you know, mm -hmm. so. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I, I remember you had a live cam in Southern California. Uh, could you remind yeah. me about what, what that live cam would show us? Yeah, it was uh, up at the site on top of Santiago Peak, which is mm. uh, the highest point in Orange County. And there weren't any other really live streaming cameras from up there. There's some fire cameras up there that'll take a picture and upload it every so often. But right. this one was live streaming and uh, it was always fun to to watch the snow falling or, you know, the fires approach and, you know, Southern California, there's always fires. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was it was always fun to to see that. And since I'm not working there anymore, I don't have the camera up there anymore. So right. unfortunately, that uh, that went away. Well, you've got a, a little bit change in your career now, and many broadcast engineers go through changes. I mean, there were time uh, there was a time when a lot of broadcast engineers went into the cellular in industry, and maybe they're still working in that. Some guys go into IT, the IT industry. Some people go into the recording industry. You've taken a turn into an allied industry, one that we all depend on. And tell us about your your new career now. Yeah, it's, uh, I never would have expected to be on this area of it, but instead of being a broadcast engineer that deals with uh, FM transmitters now, I am dealing in the network radio uh, side of things. So distributing uh, like news, distributing talk shows, full formats, things like that um, at a content distribution company and that's based here out of Denver. And uh, I mean, I've been a customer of theirs for a long time. At the previous job, we had a satellite uplink and then um, things happened. And now here I am working for them, managing their facility here. So, well, you, uh, yeah. <laughs> As a broadcast engineer in this uh, satellite communication industry, you're, you're still, uh, you're probably still in charge of some transmitters, right? As well as some kind of, you know, audio routing gear, maybe not studio gear oh. like we think of in radio, but audio routing, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, yes, transmitters, just a, a different frequency, um, much higher frequency, uh, <laughs> right. different shaped antennas. You know, mine look like ice cream bowls rather than weird sticks, things in the air. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's everything adjacent to what I was doing before, and it's... It's, it's just, it's an, how do I put this? It's learning new things while still being able to lean on the things I've already learned. I don't know if that makes sense. But anyways, that's, that's kind of where I'm at is everything's familiar, but it's a new, a new place. Um, but yeah, we have audio routing. We're using Axia and Pathfinder and um, SAS is what I walked into and... Gates Airs Codex, Bricklinks, a uh, couple of Zip Ones, APTs. So I mean, you know, it's it's all stuff that you're going to see in a radio station, but yet it's being used in a kind of a different way now. So it's new, it's exciting, it's you know, it's it's fun. Well, the title of our show is Satellite Network Operations or Network Operations Center. So we're going to, uh, you, you're going to share, share with us some pictures uh, of the network mm -hmm. operations. There's probably a few sensitive areas that you can't show us, maybe some maybe some company secrets and things like that. Uh, but uh, uh, we're going to get a good understanding of things from, from audio coming in to contact closures to uh, audio routing to the, all the codecs being used and then the satellite distribution and this is all going to be really cool uh and we're going to come back and, and start jump right into it here in just a second i'm kirk harnack uh, marcus o'rourke is our guest today and marcus does such a great job 
of describing the technologies and the techniques that he's involved in. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by Nautel, as they always do. And Nautel is having this, uh, this really cool promotion right now. It is Nautel's uh, HD uh, digital radio test drive. Uh, the Nautel Digital Radio Test Drive is offering, uh, uh, it, it's, it's intended to you know, help broadcasters break down the barriers, if you will, but help broadcasters uh, try out HD radio for themselves. It has the potential to create a critical presence on your car dashboard and help stations stay competitive in a field of alternate media choices. It's based on Nautel's software-based air chain technology, and that's kind of key here. It's a software-based air chain technology. Uh, the test drive enables broadcasters to try HD radio transmission in your market for up to six months to try to get new listeners, to put out new content, and to find new revenue, uh, revenue uh, without having to install and purchase forty to fifty thousand dollars worth of HD gear. So you can see if this is going to work out for you and get your salespeople excited, get your customers excited uh, about this, and make an impact with your listeners. So it's an easy, minimal cost option to turn on HD radio. Uh, you get to test new revenue generating opportunities with uh, your sales teams. You can experiment with new formats or languages or even short term pop up event stations. Maybe you're covering you know all of the the, the the sweet sixteen games in your in your area or the the, the high school uh, state championships and that kind of thing. In other words, you can turn on more channels uh, up to four. Uh, with, with this. If you ha want to get into a competitive situation for alternate languages, maybe you've got a, a growing Hispanic population, or in in Nashville, we have a huge Hispanic population, but we also have a lot of immigrants from Ethiopia and, and Eastern Africa that are that are living there. And wouldn't it be interesting to have, you know, a programming design for them in, in their language? So there's plenty of things that you can do to put on there. Maybe just another form. Maybe you need an oldies format. Maybe you need a yacht rock format, you know, because I would certainly tune into that. Well, check it out with Nautel and with your favorite Nautel sales rep. It's called the HD Digital Radio Test Drive and see how you can get HD radio on your station. We did it in uh, Oxford, Mississippi with our new alt rock station there, and we're having a blast with an oldies and a light uh, urban AC format in Oxford, Mississippi. Thanks a lot, Nautel. Nautel.com. You can get more details on this offer. Hey, I'm Kirk Harnack. We're here with Marcus O'Rourke on This Week in Radio Tech. Marcus uh, yeah, used to join us from uh, his old station, K-Wave, in uh, Los Angeles, but now he's at, is it, is it LinkUp? Tell me about the name of your Link company up. there, Marcus. Yeah, LinkUp Communications. Okay. And we've had uh, LinkUp's uh, uh, founder, President uh, Mark Johnson, on our show before talking about different things like uh, what the, 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 the 5G interference uh, filters that, you know, at the, at the uh, downlink end that broadcasters have to use. Um, uh, you know, what, it seems like we ought to just go ahead and start out with some pictures, unless you want to sure. get any, any storytelling done first. Maybe we can get uh, Suncast to go ahead and pop up our first first picture that, that you've provided, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Sure. Ooh. So, I mean, like, so short, 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 short history. Uh, this was um, uh, NSN here in Denver, which then was purchased by Clear Channel, which then was purchased by Orbital Media, which then we purchased. So that's uh -huh. kind of where the little chain of uh, chain of custody, chain of... <laughs> Whatever it is, the, the, right. the company. So yeah. um, uh, it's been in this facility since about 2007. And it was uh, built by AT&T. They, they had this grand scheme of, we're going to put all these different uh, COs all over the outskirts of Denver. And there's going to be this huge, um, huge boom of, of T1s and whatnot. And mm -hmm. they built it. They put everything in. And then around 2004 or five, they kind of went, I guess we don't really need it. And then it oh. sat. Oh. And then Clear Channel came in and went, oh, hey, we'll take it over and kind of made some changes, built this little uh, network operations center here. And um, it's uh, been quite the adventure uh, going through it. I mean, just for me in the last two years and then the last almost 20 years uh, with previous companies. So, um, yeah, so this is our network operations center. It's manned 24-7, just like a radio studio in big, you know, if you have a 24-hour station. Um, there's always somebody in there. We're always going to answer the phone. Uh, and that's been something that um, 
as we've brought on some customers that have come from other places, they're like, oh, you, you answered the phone. Uh, oh, I was not expecting you to answer. <laughs> so um, we make sure that our operators are trained. We always have training going on for them. But from here, we can see all of the stuff that we are uplinking by satellite here in Denver at the facility. We're mm -hmm. able to monitor incoming audio feeds for, um, uh, we have some sports customers, we have some talk show customers, we have some full form networks that come through as well. So we monitor all the audio feeds that come in as they go out and then even as they come over the satellite or um, we use the XDS system as our primary distribution platform. Uh, mm -hmm. It also does streaming. So we'll listen to the streaming uh, side of it as well. So we're, we're able to do route changes, uh, monitor audio with uh, meters, with actually turning up speakers. We're able to see spectrum analyzers of uh, stuff that we uplink. Uh, LinkUp also has customers that do their own uplinking at their own facility, um, whether it's uh, Tennessee or California or New York or wherever it ends up being, we're able to bring their uh, carriers up as well on the spectrum analyzers. You can kind of see there's those two little green screens on this, the middle center of that console there. So uh, we can patch into different uh, downlinks dishes that we have, mm -hmm. look at their, look at their uh, carrier and go, yep, you're on the air or yeah, I don't see your carrier. Do you have power? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, something I've wanted to ask, and I think you really just answered it before I asked the question. Of course, you receive plenty of f audio feeds from your mm -hmm. customers via various codecs of different brands. You already mentioned, you know, Comrex and Tyline and some things from, from, from Telos. Um, but you also receive programming via satellite yourself for redistribution on your satellite network. Is, isn't that right? Actually, uh, everything that we get is, is generated by us. So there, oh, so okay. they're, they're sent to us by okay. Codex. Um, right. okay. Uh, okay. one customer has an automation system sitting in a rack. So if right. something goes wrong, they can say, Hey, fire up that automation system. We route it to their channel and off we go and they okay, can do whatever their disaster recovery is. You're not receiving programming for redistribution. You're not receiving by, by satellite, anything. To, to no. redistribute, are you? Are you? Oh, okay. Correct. Okay. No. No. Nope. All right. Good. Yeah. Everybody likes to have their own their own networks. So uh, gotcha. Those, those yeah, networks I, I thought maybe do if, their own thing. I thought maybe if somebody was already uplinking, maybe I don't know. Does anybody use SCPC? Any SCPC analog? I guess not. That's not efficient. Not right. not analog. Uh, the oldest yeah. things that that we still have customers using are our Comstream. Um, okay. but those are. I would to say they're on their last leg is an understatement. Um, it's been it's been obsolete for like twenty years, but somehow these guys are able to keep them going and pay more power to them. Um, but yeah, are, are are you uplinking to several different satellites? Yes. Or are you, are you uh, okay? All right. Yeah, we we uh, uplink to SES eleven, SES one, SES two, Galaxy sixteen. Uh, okay. yeah, Galaxy 16. So those four come out of our facility. Um, and then we have uh, another couple of customers that are on like Galaxy 19 or something like that. But it, I mean, yeah, it's, it's all the standard, you know, broadcaster, uh, satellites. And when you uplink to a satellite, are, are you in, in, in a multiplex of audio signals, are you typically filling the space available in, in a transponder? Or set, are you filling up space in several transponders or just partial space in a transponder? It, it, it kind of depends. So you have the customers that are doing their own things. They have their own carrier on, a, on their own space on the transponder. I mean, a transponder is 35 megahertz or something like that. Okay. Um, typically, they won't use that much. They'll use um, a meg, half a meg, um, something to that effect. Um, it's usually one or two audio streams. Uh, you know, like what we do, we have several megs, but we have several different programs. It's kind of like it's a big pipe. So the, the XDS system is a big pipe. 
and it's all program based. It's not necessarily, oh, let me change it to a different channel. It's what program is, is being fed right now. It could be, uh, let's see right now, it could be, there's like two or three talk shows going on. So we're feeding those out. And then, um, there's a full-time channel that has their own channel full-time. And then we'll have, uh, like a newscast and that's a separate program, but you could schedule whatever you want on whatever port you have on your receiver. So it's oh. not like you're listening to Bob's channel. You're just going, oh, I want Bob's program A, Bob's program B, and Bob's program D. I, I don't want his program C. Yeah. So yeah. it's more efficient that way for us to manage bandwidth. Um, we can bring in more uh, capacity doing it that way. So a lot of radio stations, like the ones that I uh, am part owner of, we certainly have some XDS receivers, and you kind of talked mm -hmm. about that not only as a brand, but kind of as a, a platform, a standard, a technology, if you will. And then we have a, a receiver made by Wegener. It's one of their mm -hmm. iPump receivers. Uh, talk to me about the, you know, the, the, what are the fundamental differences in these two brands of platform and these, these types of, are, is it fundamental differences in technology, or is it just a couple different ways of doing the same thing, or? How would you describe it? It's, it, it's basically just two different ways of doing the same thing. It's an Apple and Android type of thing. You know, what, mm. what type of phone are you using? Oh, I have an Android. Oh, I have an, uh, an iPhone. So, I mean, they do the same thing in roughly the same way. Um, the concepts are basically the same. So mm -hmm. it's just, again, you get into one infrastructure, you know, oh, I just bought, you know, $400 worth of apps over my lifetime on iPhone. I'd have to do it all over again to switch to an Android or vice yeah. versa. So networks will provide their own receivers. And so they'll buy into a platform and to switch it out, well, they have to buy new receivers. So gotcha. it, it's, do they want to make the investment to make the switch? Sometimes yeah. they do yeah. and sometimes they don't. And, you know, that's a business decision on, on their part. You know, I started with uh, digital satellite receivers back in the in the DATS days, right? When the, the mm -hmm. big uh, radio networks went to DATS, and then CDAT, Spectrum Efficient DAT, came along uh, a few years after that. And, I, of course, I was a little scared by how much money those satellite receivers cost. You know, the original DATS yeah. receivers were, were huge. They were two frames that would, that would go in a rack. And then the CDAT, the Fairchild CDAT, got that down to one good size frame. And now we have satellite receivers that cost much, much, much less. In fact, I, I, maybe I don't have a clear a clue as to how much a typical XDS satellite receiver costs, but I got the feeling it ain't ten thousand uh, dollars. It's a it's a lot no. less than that. It, can, can you give us a ballpark of like if 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 I you know if I'm part of a of a network like let's say the the Southern Miss football network and they send me a satellite receiver just for that, what kind of money is somebody laying out for me to have that satellite receiver? Um, I, uh, you're asking me questions. I don't really have answers to, I, I'm that's not right, in sales. Right. I am an engineering. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I, I mean, it is I, less than $10,000 and it's more than $500. I mean, yeah, I, I had the impression these range, were in but... the neighborhood of, of, of one to $2,000 worth of, you know, costs there. Of course, they're not selling them at retail. Well, I guess the company that makes them, uh, maybe XDS is kind of retailing them to the satellite networks, but the networks are buying them in bulk. Uh, and, right. and is, is there, is there a market in used XDS receivers? Like if I want to start up a, uh, I don't know, a, a, a car racing network of my own, uh, to cover, I don't know, sure. peewee cars going around a track, uh, and I wanted to buy 50 <laughs> satellite receivers, th th there's a market for, I could pick up used ones, you think? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, if you look on eBay right now, there's, I mean, your probably top three ones are going to be, uh, some XDS receivers there. Sure. But the problem okay. is, is how old are they? They're like 20 yeah. years old. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. the original, what I call the OG uh, XDS receivers. <laughs> um, okay. they've, they've come a long way. Uh, the, the current models um, have better storage in them. They have live wire, which yeah. I like. Um, oh, XDS they, receivers they will, do, can have live wire. Okay. Yes, the, the S model, which is the current model. Ah, okay. Um, the S model also has better internals for some uh, future um, 
uh, features that they're they're looking at uh, coming out with in the next couple of years. So, I mean, there is a ton of the Q models out there, which work just great. Mm -hmm. They work just fine. Even the original OG ones work just fine. But, you know, you start getting into um, a lot of people like to delay programming. And so oh, what yeah. happens is yeah. it records on the internal record, uh, the internal media. But if that media has been running for 20 years, I mean, it's got a finite amount of rights. So <laughs> it will fail if it hasn't already. Yeah, at, at some point. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, so many, I, I, I'm not harping on, on XDS, but, you know, they've been sitting there workhorses for years and years. And sometimes that fault light is on, right, uh, on, on the yep. front of it. And that always kind of annoys me. So I found a fix for that. I take a piece of black uh, tape. <laughs> Sorry. That will work, Sorry. too. <laughs> hey, yeah, uh, we're talking the, to Marcus. If it's the red light, then that's a problem. Yeah, if it's the green light, that's a problem, yeah. So we're talking to Marcos O'Rourke. Uh, he's at LinkUp Communications. And I'm sorry, we just looked at one picture so far, and I asked a bunch of questions. We're going to get into a lot more pictures here right after this break. We're talking about satellite communications and kind of how things really work at the Network Operations Center. And as engineers, you know, we consume all this stuff. we got to make it work at the receiving end and uh, hook up all those contact closures and, and make sure the audio gets you know, downloaded or gets transmitted the, the right way. Uh, hey, we got a quick message here from our friends at Broadcast Bionics, tell you how to make more fantastic programming coming out of your studio. We'll be right back. Camera One from Broadcast Bionics, designed to bring video to your audio content, visualizing radio and podcasts for social media. Camera One can automatically create, capture, and brand professionally switched video for live streaming or upload, making your production shareable. Control and configure using a web browser on any device. Camera One is available as a 4-camera or 8-camera system using the Blackmagic A10 Mini range, including the A10 Mini Extreme. You can use cameras to suit your studio and your budget. You'll need one camera for a studio wide shot and usually one camera per microphone. A standard multi-channel sound card or IP driver monitors audio from each studio microphone and we work natively with Axia systems. Ideally, this will be a post-fader feed from each mic, although you can use pre-fade audio or a mic split if that's all you have available. These audio levels are used to intelligently switch the video feed when each contributor is talking. You can also group microphones together into one shot and use the audio from a mixer's aux bus. You can use Camera One's auto switch feature or disable it and switch using the on-screen buttons or the buttons on the ATEM. Recordings can automatically start when you tell the system you're on the air. This on-air indication can be linked to your studio's red lights via IP or an Avantech Adam GPIO interface. You can quickly browse all the videos that have been automatically created during your broadcast, download them and post. Camera One is a user installable system. You'll need a good spec Windows 10 PC, i7 with plenty of storage and 16 gig of RAM. It's better if this machine isn't used for anything else. Remember, you can control the software in a web browser on another device on your network. Camera One, a thrifty way of creating scroll-stopping video from your show or podcast from Broadcast Bionics. What an innovative product from uh, Broadcast Bionics. And they make other things, too, that help you create content. Uh, your disc jockeys, your, your program directors, uh, owners of your station will love uh, you for uh, suggesting and installing this kind of gear. It's good stuff. Check it out from Broadcast Bionics. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack. It's uh, episode 709 of This Week in Radio Tech. And I'm talking to Marcos O'Rourke, who's now with LinkUp Communications. He's been there for a little while, and now he's really gotten his feet wet into the Network Operations Center. Marcos, uh, are you ready to move on to a couple more pictures, and we'll, we'll see what's going on? There. Sure. All yeah, right. I kind of had this whole little narrative, and, and I organized them that way, and eh, we'll just go through it this way. So that Network <laughs> Operations Center, <laughs> they, uh, they, so like I said, they monitor the incoming side of things. Uh, this okay. is a much older picture of, um, of like our wall of codecs. We have significantly increased in how many codecs we've had since this, but you know, they can see all the meters that are coming in. They can log into these devices, uh, try to reconnect if there's some sort of disconnect that happens. Uh, but they, they monitor what's going on. Um, and then the next picture is uh, they monitor on the receive side. 
So this is like listening to your air feed for, for oh, us. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we're able to listen to um, all of our different um, feeds that we have. I mean, we have so many things going on at times. It's We have to have multiple receivers to go, okay, what? We're not able to hear everything at once. Uh, some of these feed into automatic systems uh, for um, for silence detect or, or for whatever things we're doing with them. Um, and then as part of the whole facility, the next picture kind of shows that we are, you know, it is, well, broadcast has become very IT centric, whether oh, yeah. we like it or not. It is all about the computer. So, uh, Suncast, if you can, there we go. Yeah. I mean, this is reality for us now. So we have to know how to use computers, how to maintain servers, and pretty much everything runs off of a server in some fashion. The XDS systems backend is all servers. The, yeah. you know, audio encoding is really all servers. So, you know, having an IT mind and IT experience and it it's no, I don't want to do that. I was trying to move this out of the way, out of my screen um, is really, it's more important than it ever has been. And I mean, kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent, but that's where we're moving to as we go forward. So I've, uh, I've got a couple the, questions about yeah, about yeah. Uh, audio about audio coming in from your different suppliers. Uh, you showed uh, on a previous picture. You showed uh, different brands of audio codecs, and and I've been to some mm -hmm. uh, network operation centers where they had yeah uh, one or two or fifty of most any brand of audio codec uh, out there. Um, when a when a show is going to run. Uh, whether it's weekly or daily or, or whatever, but there's a show. Let's say I produce a show. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say I produce a show out of a, a, a radio station in, in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, a sports talk show, and I'm, I'm going to be on for three hours, right? Uh, as, as the local producer in Memphis, uh, do, do, am I the one that initiates a codec connection to the network operations center? And if, if I do, but it doesn't work for some reason, is somebody at the knock available to help us get connected and figure out what's wrong? Yes. Well, yes, sort of, and yes. So okay. <laughs> it kind of depends on what the network is. Uh, uh, one, of, one of the uh, customers, they do, they have their own studios. So everybody connects to them, and then they have a point-to-point -point link that's always nailed up that goes to us. Oh, okay. uh, one right. of one of our other customers, they have studios spread out all over the place. So yeah. they will connect to us on um, like Comrex Bricklinks or whatever it ends up being. Um, but yeah, it's they'll drop now, one you... and then somebody else will come up on another and we'll have that automatically route to the right encoder. And um, but if for some reason they have a problem, yeah, hey, we're having a problem connecting. We'll be able to log in on our side, try to make a reverse connection to them. Ah, okay. You know, okay. Walk them through it. Typically, it's so, it's something like, "Hey, um, yeah, you have backhoe fade." They'll go outside back, and look. Oh yeah, look, there's a construction crew outside. Back in the uh, back in the early uh, days of of this kind of work, uh, earlier days, a lot of people were using ISDN codecs, right? And so there was yes. a per yep. minute cost in being connected. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you, you wouldn't be connected unless you had to be connected because it cost somebody money right. to be connected. Right. Um, but these days, most people connect via probably public internet or maybe some kind of private connection if it's, if it's, a, a, if it's a lot of things going together. Um, are, are there networks that maybe only program three hours a day but just stay connected all the time? Does that ever happen? Uh, there are. Yeah, we have, we have a couple that uh, program for like eight eight hours a day or so, and but they'll just stay connected. They provided a, a codec for us, and it's just over the internet, and so they'll just leave it connected. The internet has become a lot more robust over the last 10, 15 years, um, especially using code, or, uh, codecs that have multiple internet connections. You go through say Comcast and like Lumen or AT&T or CenturyLink or whoever it is, you have two different routes 
and some of these codecs will just bring them together and you won't even know that you lost one except for a little light pops up on the front of the box or it'll send you an email or SMP yeah. traps or something. But as far as the listener or, you know, the end user, which is the radio station, they won't know. They won't hear a difference. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. All right. I didn't mean to get us off on that tangent. I was just no, curious as to, uh, <laughs> how, how, how your customers, your program suppliers, you know, connect to you and, and what, uh, what machinations they may need to go through. And, and since the internet, you know, doesn't really cost much more to, to use <laughs> than, than, uh, um, then it could be connected all the time. By the way, years ago, like 20 years ago, I was at probably at, at uh, I want to say, CBS Radio in New York. And uh, uh, they were telling me they had built some kind of automatic thing to disconnect their ISDN codecs if there was, had been no audio on them for too long. They said one time they got a bill for many, many, many thousands of dollars because somebody in, in Beirut had left, you know, a, an ISDN oh, connection oh, up, no. you know, for a week or something, you know, and the phone bill came in for that. It was like, holy cow, we, we're going to disconnect this. We're gonna, if, if the reporter's I, not on. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, I have done that once. Uh, somehow, I, I, so this Zephyr was on like around knee level and somehow they had hit connect to... Oh. Another Zephyr somewhere. Nobody knew about it for like a couple of weeks. We got the bill. AT and T went, "Yeah, you owe us a lot of money." And we're like, "Oops." And any any chance you can? Uh... I mean, they forgave it, but they said, "Do it again, and you're paying for it." Yeah, yeah, I hear you. All right, let's let's move on. Next next picture here, Suncast. What you got for us? So, like I said, it was built by AT and T. Uh, they had these fiber runs all over the place. They had uh, this, they had these uh, conduits that come into the building. These are like six inch conduits, something like that, multiples of them. And they had this intent to bring in all this fiber into this facility. And well, they, either they never pulled it in or they pulled it out um, after they left or before they left. But all these fiber trays are just sitting above uh, some of these areas and we don't run that much of fiber or network cables or anything, but it's a really interesting little uh, um, uh, artifact that we get to uh, kind of point out every once in a while. Um, so the, the facility uh, is manned 24 seven. We have to be providing content 24 seven. So the next photo is we take it seriously. Oh my goodness. And this, wow. uh, this beast will keep <laughs> the place on the air for a long time. Uh, when AT&T came in, they had a lot higher energy requirements. And so we're, we're barely tickling this thing. Um, so we have a lot of runtime that we can get out of the UPS, the batteries, this generator, and so, um, yeah, uh, that, next that picture. generator, uh, that generator looks like it's big enough to not only run your network gear, it'll also run the coffee machines and the hot tubs, uh, and the, the sun tanning beds all at the same time. Well, I mean, <laughs> critical infrastructure is the coffee. Critical machines. Is great. That's, right. That's right. I mean, more important than the transmitters in some cases. <laughs> oh, uh, if right. you're working what, what, on the transmitters, yeah. you got to have your cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Next. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of the, the view out the back. Uh, this is the uh, dish farm, as we like to call it. Um, we're uplinking to multiple satellites. We're downlinking from multiple satellites. And some of these are backup dishes as well. So we're able to take one down for maintenance, uh, shift everything over to another, and still be up on the air. But... Um, I've never seen a red satellite dish. What does that mean? Uh, they uh, they painted it. Previous owners painted it. Oh, it they okay. moved it from another facility where they didn't want to be able to see them from the street or something oh. to that effect. Oh, okay. So like a brick color. They painted brick it the same color, color of yeah. the building. And then yeah. when they moved, they brought them over. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're normally white. Gotcha. Now, and, and I know there's... there's um, 
maybe a little bit of advantage to one design of feed or another. I see the two big dishes there look like, I guess you'd call that a cassegrain feed. I yep. think that's the right yes. word for it. Uh, what mm -hmm. benefit is there in a cassegrain feed in, in this situation? Obviously, the, the electronics are easier to get to because they're at the back of the dish instead of at the right. focal point of the dish. Is, is, is that the main advantage? Uh, that's one advantage. You get more gain out of a cassegrain, <clears throat> excuse me, out of a cassegrain than of an offset. Uh, oh, if you kind of look okay. off to the left, those littler ones there, those are offsets. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. So the, the cassegrains, you get uh, more gain. Is okay. kind of one of the main advantages. But yeah, like you said, yeah. it's easier to get to some of the things um, off the back. Cool. Uh, it, it's always fun. So every day, I will walk the facility, look for alarm lights, look for things that are that it shut off or that are just smoking or whatever. Make sure the dishes are still out back, you know. Uh, and every once in a while, I'm greeted by um, some friends that I have out there, you know, some some friends that like to buzz me at times. <laughs> but uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> We do have do, a do you have snow? raccoons that live next door. <laughs> do you have snow and ice build up there? Uh, are those heated dishes, or what do you need to do when, the, when there's precip? Yes. So uh, if you look at, uh, so this dish, it looks really thick, but what yeah. it is is there's a, a plenum behind it, and uh, yeah. these six-meter six dishes have these hot air uh, heaters that blow hot air into that, that little plenum behind it, and that'll melt the snow off and kind of keep it off. We have a couple of other dishes that have the uh, little blankets on the back that stick on the back and just have the little heating elements and that'll melt the dish or melt the snow off the dish. So a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, kind of depends on, on the age of the dish and how big of a dish you really have to heat. So, but yeah. Okay. And then, um, you, we do have uh, some customers that buy a lot of XDS receivers. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll bring them to our facility. We'll program them up. And that's the next photo is a cart full of them. We'll, we'll program oh. them up, get them ready to go, put labels on them and ship them out. Or if for some reason the, the network wants us to maintain a stockpile, um, we'll pre-configure them and stick them on a shelf um, in the back that's for customer equipment. And then they'll be like, Hey, we want to ship, uh, you know, W X Y Z a receiver. All right. Slap a label on it. Off it goes. So we're able to rapidly get re uh, replacement receivers out. Yeah. I apparently so. Cool. All right. All right. What's next? So that's kind of the end of the photos that I have. Oh, okay, we'll go. Actually, you've timed that just right. I'm going to have a bunch of follow-up questions, but right now we've got to take a, a break and hear from one of our sponsors. It's Broadcasters General Store, and they represent, you know, a lot of your favorite manufacturers. Uh, I would imagine that Marcus has experience with these guys. It's Innovonics. Innovonics has this uh, pretty new, I mean, it's been out for maybe a year or so. It's a triple receiver. It's their Model 677, if I'm not mistaken, uh, receiver. And what does this thing do? Well, the 677, first of all, it's designed to be an EAS receiver because usually you have to monitor two EAS uh, monitoring stations, two stations you're assigned to monitor, and NOAA weather radio. Uh, so let's take a quick look at this uh, video from Innovonics about the 677. The 677 Triple Tuner is a monitor receiver in a compact half-rack package. It has three built-in SDR-based frequency agile tuners, each one programmable for AM, FM, or weather band reception. Each receiver has a balanced monoural XLR output to provide audio to an EAS monitor or off-air monitor throughout the broadcast facility. It has self-logging alarms that constantly check for audio loss, low signal, RDSPI mismatch, and EAS alert tones. Online alarm notifications alert personnel with email or SMS messages. The dynamic web interface provides control and monitoring remotely via any web-enabled device. In addition, the 677 has remote listening available via a web stream. 
It allows up to 10 simultaneous stream listeners, and SNMP is fully supported. Of course, the most important feature for any radio receiver is its reception quality. The 677 handles this like a pro by incorporating a modern SDR-based design for excellent signal-to-noise ratios and rejection even in the most challenging conditions. The 677 is simple to set up with front panel OLED menu and jog wheel, giving you access to three selectable tuners. In addition, a built-in web server provides expanded remote setup, operation control, and remote audio monitoring via internet stream. On the front of the 677, there's an LED bar meter to indicate audio output levels, a headphone jack, and LED alarm indicators for each receiver. There's a large OLED display and jog wheel with intuitive menus for easy setup of the three receivers and editing over all programming parameters. And you can get the uh, 677 from Innovotics at Broadcaster's General Store. Their website, it's bgs.cc, bgs.cc, or call them at 352-622-7700. They love to do phones. They're built to do phones. They'll answer the phone and talk to you. And they have up-to-date manufacturer uh, shipping and, of course, uh, really good pricing information with your discounts. Thanks a lot to Broadcaster General Store for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech along with Innovonics. Hey, I'm Kirk Harnack. We're broadcasting uh, from uh, the control room of what had been Cat Country 105.5, uh, just south of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Uh, we're also here at the studios of WAKY, Wacky Radio, uh, licensed to Radcliffe, Kentucky, also just south of Louisville. And uh, they do very well in the Louisville ratings. And I'm just I'm on the road making a trip to go see mom. Uh, she's in the hospital. Uh, we're going to see how she's doing tonight. And uh, so I was really thankful to the folks here at uh, Wacky Radio for uh, letting me come in here and use this control room. It's got an Axia console in here, an Axia Radius console. By the way, these studios were built by a longtime uh, broadcast engineer by the name of Kirk Wesley. Shares my first name. Uh, Kirk and I went to different high schools at the same time in uh, in Central Kentucky. And I was very grateful for Kirk to be choosing Axia Gear to go in here. So thanks a lot. I think Kirk's got his own IT company now. and That doesn't surprise me a bit. All right, we're talking to Marcos O'Rourke with LinkUp Communications. Uh, he is uh, some kind of director of engineering. He's in charge of a whole lot of stuff. And uh, Marcos, um, uh, is there anything you want to finish up about what you were telling us about about the knock and, and the, you know, what, what might we as broadcast engineers find interesting about uh, what you do there? Um, and I guess I'll continue that question by saying, when you went to work there, your eyes were open to some new techniques and things oh. that you didn't realize, uh, having j just just been a customer and and not working there. What do you want to tell us about? Yeah, it's 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 really interesting just to see how the whole process uh, comes together as far as network radio. You know, you you listen to your favorite talk show or whatever, and Commercials just happen, they play, and as far as a listener knows, there's just commercials. But when you take that step back into network radio, what becomes a network spot and then what becomes a local spot? And um, I know many engineers kind of understand that, yes, there are local spots that play out of the receiver, yeah. but not everybody really understands that. They're like, I heard this one commercial, we'll have some stations that'll call and be like, this one commercial played and it just sounded weird. What was it? When was it? It's not playing for everybody the same because your market was, you know, it could have been John Deere that bought for your market and not nationwide. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, let's, let's talk. You know, yeah. Uh, so it, it used to be, uh, you know, in the early, you know, well, throughout a lot of satellite history, uh, if uh, there were national spot buys, they would buy, like, so let's say you'd buy a spot on, uh, I'm going to just do some rewind here and say Neil Bortz's show coming from WSB in Atlanta, and he was uh, syndicated nationally. So an advertiser, a national advertiser would buy that show. And I don't know if they were regionalized at all on that, but let's say they weren't. And so the spot would run nationwide. So if you were a regional tire company, you wouldn't buy national, you wouldn't buy a national program. Uh, only if you were, I don't know, McDonald's. Uh, or Macy's or something else that's nationwide, mm -hmm. would you buy nationwide ads? But that's all changed. Uh, I mean, it's probably been changed for a good 10 or 20 years now where you can buy certain markets through uh, through your program distributor or maybe through LinkUp or however that works, but you guys can make 
certain receivers, certain XDS receivers, store and then play at the right time certain ads. Is that right? Right. Right. Absolutely. Oh. And it's, it's, I mean, you could get as granular as per station. That's yeah. going to be insanity, though, for whoever's doing the traffic for that. Um, generally, it's like regions or states. Um, they'll do ad buys. But, um, yeah, it, it plays out. Your station will play John Deere, for example. The network will be playing International Star Registry. You know, get your star today. But, yeah. uh, like, let's say you're there in um, Kentucky. You're getting John Deere. Next door in uh, Tennessee, they're getting International Star Registry at the same exact time that you're getting John Deere. So. Yeah. But as far as the station is concerned, they don't know any different. It's just playing out of the receiver. Gotcha. So, uh, and I guess, yeah, and the, the, the station might have to sign an affidavit. Yeah, we, we cleared the whole program, but they don't have to right. sign, we cleared John Deere. That's, that's you guys or somebody else that's saying, well, you know, that, that's what got scheduled for, for that station. So, yeah, that, that would be the traffic yeah. company that does that. We don't, we don't do uh, ad sales. Okay, so that's a separate company. A traffic company yeah. sells mm -hmm. sells those ads, and and they can yeah. be they could be localized down to the individual satellite receiver, and in a way they are, but they're collected into states or or regions. Okay, correct. Yeah, okay. into groups, so, um, basically. Yeah, yeah. For, for example, uh, based in Nashville or actually Brentwood, Tennessee, is Tractor Supply Company, and mm -hmm. I don't know the tractor supplies nationwide. They're certainly in a, a great number of agricultural areas, but I don't know that they're in Oregon. So, you know, they, they wouldn't want to waste advertising dollars being on a show that's playing in, in Oregon. They would just want to be right. on areas where they, where they have a store where you can go right. shopping at Tractor Supply. Okay. Or like okay. In-N-Out Burger. Mm, I love In-N-Out Burger. Yeah. They don't, you know, <laughs> Denver here is the farthest east they go. No reason uh -huh. to be running In-N-Out ads in New York because you're yeah. just going to make people angry going, gosh, I wish I had an In-N-Out here. But, you know, it's, they'll, they'll regionalize it that way. They'll regionalize it, you know, for whatever reason. It, it could be there's an Albertsons on the West Coast and it's uh, Safeway on the East Coast or, you know, however that works out too. It could be two. There's so many different ways of, of, of uh, slicing up the pie. It's, you know, that's now, we, we've all just, outside of my, my understanding of, and sphere of, of influence. Just to update you, I, I, we didn't get to talk about it, but uh, we, we got about three minutes right now. We're going to do a couple more ads, and then we're going to have a tip of the week. And so, Marcos, I'm going to need you to think of a tip of the week. Like maybe there's a, a website you can go to say, hey, is this working or not working? Uh, is there an outage here? When is the next sun outage? When, what do I need to, you know, maybe you've got some kind of uh, advice to give our, our engineer listeners. But uh, I wanted to ask you, about about contact closures um uh yes. I, I, we re now you mentioned that some xds receivers now have live wire i recently got a wegener receiver uh that had live has live wire and it has live wire gpos coming out of it and i gotta tell you that was so convenient i was looking forward no i was yeah. not looking forward to two hours of soldering d you know, d sub connectors or even just using the adapters to to go into stuff uh and i found out that wait a minute i don't have to do any of that just one Ethernet connection into my LiveWire network, and I just subscribe to the right stuff. I have to set it up in the receiver, uh, and then subscribe to the right stuff externally, and voila, I'm done. Now, now, here's my question. You know, for some years, we've had, I guess, what, what people call digital contact closures. And they're carried digitally, but in the receiver, they still give you either a relay or a collected ground uh, output to give you, a, you know, kind of a physical electric output. Um, and... <clears throat> Ever since they came out with digital closures, I've always wondered what happened to 25 hertz and 35 hertz subaudible tone closures. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe in 2005 did they did they run out? Did the world run out of 25 hertz tones? What happened exactly? So maybe you yeah, can the mind the mind that had them uh, kind of shut down. <laughs> the mind, no, the mind closed. That's right. <laughs> Well, talk to me uh, about that, about contact closures and and this kind, this world of how this works in the next two minutes. Okay, so uh, like you said, uh, in band signaling, which was those those uh, subaudible tones, they just became 
there are, there are better ways of doing it, more elegant ways of doing it. Not everybody had them adjusted right. So you'd have your, your show or whatever, and then all of a sudden you'd hear because it was too loud and it was distorting and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So they started going to out-of-band signaling, basically. And there's, you'd have your audio stream and then you'll have your uh, control stream. And that'll wow. have all of your all of your cues. And now they're basically, you know, strings of of letters and numbers of ASCII text just flowing over this little stream. And then your okay. receiver goes, "Oh, hey, I see that pattern. I know what I'm supposed to do with that. I'm supposed to close this relay or play this uh, spot or do whatever I need to do." So it's it's become this stream of basically UDP. Uh, data that goes over the satellite. Ah, okay. Okay. All right. Well, that that makes total sense. Uh, the the control stream has no awareness of what's happening on the audio stream, but the device that's that's injecting those, the, the computer program that is making that happen, is uh, totally aware. And of course, the right. satellite receiver you know receives that control stream, and it doesn't know that Neil Bortz got done talking, but it knows it's supposed to close a contact right now. Exactly. And, and right. which one yeah, is it, it's basically part? married into a, uh, a, a big mul uh, mux stream. So you have all your yeah. audio stuff and it's all timed together. It's all one big timed system. So your, your relays or your net cues aren't going to slip too far. And I guess there's enough bandwidth for, let's say, top of the hour, four minutes, five minutes, six minutes after the hour. There's a lot of them happening at once on a network mm -hmm. full of programs that start and stop, you know, at 59.50 or restart at six after or whatever. So there's, there's enough bandwidth for the whole bunch of these to happen at the same time yep. <laughs> on, dis, on disparate networks, right? Right, yeah, it's always fun. We have this one monitor that, that watches them come in. You get it to that yeah. like top of the hour, six after, all of a sudden it's like <laughs> that comes across yeah, the yeah. screen. Yeah, Every, everybody started talking at the same time because that's when the shows start. Uh, well, then, yep. then one more one more quick question. Then before we have to go to our last break, if if I'm a radio station and I think I'm missing some contact closures, what troubleshooting should I go through? Because the first thing you want to do is you know blame the network, but right. I, I, you re check yourself first. And I have found that since we have computer logging nowadays, compared to literally 30 years ago, 30 years ago it was nobody's fault. I mean, you know. Nobody would claim that. Oh, it's all the, the trouble's fine leaving here, you know. Exactly. Uh, so, so, but nowadays it, you 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 talk to the knock and they can look up if the closure was not only sent but they're receiving them too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we're we're monitoring, we're logging it, going out, coming in, when down to you know a very very precise timestamp. Um, we could even see. So if your receiver has, um, let's say, uh, the, uh, who's it, Neil, Neil Borsch? Show? Yeah, well, I just, yeah and, the, he, he doesn't do a show you know, anymore, but I. Anyways, like, let's say his, his local break closure or the net yeah. queue. Right. If you have that assigned to a relay, we can see, yeah, no, your receiver received it, closed the relay, and did what it was supposed to do. So uh, there's, okay. there's ways of being able to see that on the receiver. but. To look at it from the station side, you know, sometimes those connectors come loose. Sometimes sure. the, uh, you know, the net queue's not put in the right field. You you put it in pin two instead of pin one, and yeah, you know. So, or so the, you, the more fun one is that yeah. um, so the XDS system and Wagner, I believe, also does this too. Is you'll take it by satellite, but if for some reason satellite goes away, it goes to a backup streaming through the internet. And if right. you lost that for some reason, there is a delay of switching over ah. to satellite. If it yeah, happened yeah. in that yeah. right spot. <laughs> it's possible so, you didn't yeah. get it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Un un understood. I wish we had more time. We're going to take a quick break. But Marcos, uh, you, you yes. uh, agreed to help me out with a commercial. <laughs> I just talked to Angry Audio's Mike Dosh, the, the founder and owner of Angry Audio. Talked to him about two hours ago on the phone. And uh, and we were talking about uh, you know different products, the, the Rave console and other things that they're making. And uh, then you said you're using some of Angry Audio's mic processing right now. Why don't you uh, give us a little 60 second blurb about uh, your satisfaction with uh, Corny Gould's mic processing from Angry Audio? 
My satisfaction is I am very satisfied. So I was able to review the uh, Smooth and the Rebel um, mic pre's, and oh my gosh, I was just absolutely floored with just easy. I just plugged it in, and without really doing much, I was like, wow, this really sounds good. And then, you know, pulled a little front panel off, and I could tweak it a little bit. But there wasn't much that I had to do to really get it to sound good. Um, I mean, I know that the Smooth is meant for the SM7 and the Rebel is meant for the RE20. I had a couple of other microphones, and I'm like, you know, let me try it and just see. And even with these other other brand microphones, it sounded pretty good. So they've done an amazing job of of basically making it a just plug in a plug and play box for audio processing. And I mean, right now I'm. I'm not using an audio process. I'm not using a mic processor, but I am using their their uh, Chameleon C6 software to process my uh, my mic's audio right now. And um, you know, it was a pretty straightforward. You know, turn on the software, choose the preset that I want, make a couple little minor tweaks, and off I go. Um, at uh, with a uh, link up, we've we've used their uh, C levels on several of our uh, uh, audio encoders, and they <laughs> are just amazing. I know I'm saying amazing a lot, but I really am amazed that just it's this little box. You plug the audio in, and it does what you expect it to do, without having to really change and crank some knobs here and there, and it's invisible. The C level, it's absolutely invisible with what it's doing to the audio. So cool. Yeah. Props, props that, to Corny and to and to Catfish for making some amazing products. That's Angry Audio, the website, angryaudio.com. And uh, uh, they're sold through all your favorite broadcast dealers, including Broadcaster General Store that we were talking about just, uh, just a little while ago. Uh, one more sponsor we got to tell you about, and that is Max Connect. And I'm so excited about their U.192 box. And what it lets you do is you can run one of these software-based uh, uh, FM processors, uh, like uh, the Stereo Tool or Breakaway One or Omnia SST. Anything that runs uh, typically in a Windows environment, uh, you can, uh, you know, how do you get your composite signal out of that? Well, uh, there, there have been some sound cards on the market, a little bit hard to find, that do an adequate job, but the Max Connect U.192 was designed exactly to give you the highest quality, perfect quality uh, composite MPX output based on uh, a USB connection into these software processors. So if you want to do it right, you want your composite to be perfect, and hey, ask any engineer who knows about composite, it needs to be perfect. Otherwise, your whole FM signal is compromised, and not in a good way, uh, compromised in a bad way. Uh, and the U192 was designed specifically to do this. It's the first thing in, in the uh, industry that's been designed to handle the composite signal. I mean, from front to back, from end to end, sample rate, uh, a, a direct DC output, everything like that is done properly in the U.192 from Max Connect. Check it out at the Max Connect website. I promise you, you'll be delighted uh, if you use one of these software processors and come and you need composite. Come out of it this way, and you will have perfect composite FM stereo audio. It'll be lovely. Thanks a lot, Max Connect, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. We just got one second. And I do mean just a few seconds. Uh, Marcus, can you give us any kind of a, a tip of the week, anything, any resource or something you'd like engineers to know? Dishpointer.com. That's really huge on knowing where to point your dish. Um, oh, okay. I'm going to do it real, yeah. real quick. Dishpointer.com, how to point your dish. Uh, check the polarization of your dish because that's usually the problem. If you put a 5G filter on there, you might have twisted it and you'll have a problem. Um, yep. Yeah, that, those are the quick ones for you. <laughs> okay. I'll have them in the show notes. Dishpointer.com. And, uh, and check yes. your dish's polarity. Uh, we used to check polarity with a spectrum analyzer. Is there a non-spectrum analyzer way to get that close enough? Uh, you could do it. I mean, if you sit there with your laptop watching the receiver, eek, yeah. okay, do I have better Ebno? Eek, and just, it takes time. It's a lot slower, yeah. but it works. Yeah. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, I, we used to do it by nulling it out and then going exactly 90 degrees off from that, and, and that, that was pretty close. 
Yeah. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Marcus O'Rourke has been our guest. Marcus, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks also to Suncast, who has been our uh, producer today, as usual. Marcus, hope to have you back sometime. So thanks again for, for being with us and, and giving us some great pictures thank, and great advice. Thank you very much. Uh, you're very welcome. Anytime. All right. Uh, we're going to uh, head on out and we're going to see you next week on another episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.